Hello. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Deborah Weaver. I'm the new executive director, relatively new for the Watershed Alliance. And I'm very pleased that you're all here today. I um, hope you enjoy the cider and cookies that we brought. And um, I don't think I need to tell this crowd the mission of the organization, but I, I will say just that on my part, uh, hearing the mission and feeling inspired by it was one of the things that brought me into working for the Alliance, the whole idea of not only restoring and protecting the, this wonderful watershed that we all share, but celebrating as well, I think is a really important aspect. Um, and today we're here to learn more and to find out um, what we can learn about the Kakis Pond project. And for those of you that were contributors to this um, research and study, we really thank you for participating and helping us get this off the ground. Um, I'm not going to say too much more because there are people who are far more equipped and, and intelligent and scientific than I am, but I am just thanking you very much for being here today and we really appreciate you taking the time. I understand for some of you it was a big sacrifice <laughs> to walk out of that football game, so please. <laughs> 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 Don't say anything because we're recording. <laughs> 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 Don't say a word. Don't say a word. Don't say a word. So I'm going to turn over the presentation to Betsy and, um, and her expert uh, here and uh, thank you again for, for being here today. Thank you. Um, I'm Betsy White, the Advocacy Director for the Watershed Alliance, and every time we come to talk about Cockney's Pond, the sun comes up, and it just really makes it so obvious why we do what we're doing, what we're doing. Um, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous area, um, and, you know, as if I had to tell you that. Um, uh, so this pond, this project was, uh, arose out of concerns for the pond itself. Um, a lot of people have a history with the pond, and they took note of the conditions. Uh, it is a living organism, so to speak, so it does change here and there, but the changes that we were seeing were not, um, they were not good changes. The blooms in the, in the uh, herring run, uh, the blooms along the south shore there, um, there's a lot of conditions. Um, but as I said, it's a, a living organism, so you can't just look at it and say the cause is this, this, and this. Um, so what we did was we decided that an intensive study was due so that we could really get to the, the heart of the matter and figure out the best way to manage it. Um, so we turned to the experts who uh, conducted the Mass Asteroids Project, um, Dr. Howes in the Coastal Systems Lab at UMass Dartmouth uh, School for Marine Science and Technology. Um, so this is kind of a, a mini uh, MEP study. Um, he also helped to conduct the bread and cheese study as a refinement for the larger MEP study. So they, they know the river, they're very tied to the river because of all the research they've done. They're tied to the river because they're environmental scientists. So I think that the group that, that we have working on this, this pond is, is, they're very excited for it too. I mean, they love this little microcosm here. It's a great study area. And um, we're hoping that whatever comes out of this talk will not only help the pond, but help um, the you know Richmond and Cornell ponds, uh, Quicksand ponds that are experiencing the same things. We've got uh, asked by people in those areas, what are you guys doing about the pond? And we're hoping that we can give them a blueprint of what we did um, to help them out. So um, it goes beyond the, this pond, it goes regionally. Um, and speaking of regionally, I just want to say that this project could not be done without the collaboration of public and private funds, the, um, the concern of the residents and the citizens. You guys are really what made this project happen, and we are very appreciative of that. Um, I'm looking to fund phase two through grants. Um, we are looking for $27,000 right now. We have got a $5,000 grant, so we're hoping to get grants to start phase two. Um, we're also always looking for, for money, so, um, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Howes because he uh, <coughs> will introduce you to the project and then get down into what, what his group is doing. Thanks, Betsy. I'm always happy to come to Westport. And if you don't believe me, think of that I left the house with a smile with the Patriots only up by three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if I'm doing that, I must really love it. The, um, I'm going to talk today, this is an update presentation. Um, people wanted to know after the first 10 months where we were in the project. Uh, it's really slated to be a two year or so 
uh, initial feasibility study uh, for the restoration of Taki's Pond. Uh, and and the, to just bring it around, when we do these um, Massachusetts Estuaries Project analyses of the entire Westport Estuary in this case, we do have to look at some of the freshwater ponds in the area, and we have to look at some of the salt ponds in the area as well. But that doesn't mean that the salt ponds like Cockey's Pond got the attention that it should have gotten in that analysis, uh, because the real effort was a whole system, whole watershed uh, analysis. We did get enough information as part of that, mainly through WRWA's work that we've been doing for years on the uh, on a few of the ponds of which Cock East was one, not as part of the estuarine monitoring, but part of the pond monitoring project. We did have an, enough data on that to really do an assessment, a rough assessment, not a good detail assessment, a rough assessment of Cock East, enough to know. And we did the MEP analysis that Cock East was uh, impaired, okay? So it's, but the thought was that it would be somewhat restored if Westport, West Branch of the Westport and East Branch were, were restored, nitrogen was reduced, but it would need some special attention in and of itself. Because although it's attached to the Westport, as you'll see today, it's enough isolated from the Westport that it really has its own little ecosystem, its own little tide range, everything is sort of in and of itself unique cocky style. And so it will take a special analysis or a special, sorry, effort uh, if you want to restore it restore it. It will not just go along and follow with the rest of it. That being said, this is only really part one of the feasibility study analysis, but we'll see, we'll see where it goes. I really just want to come out and, and meet you all and thank you for supporting this project because without you, it wouldn't get done. The state's not going to step up and do it. The feds certainly are not going to come in and do it. And I work for the state, the fed, if they're here, they'd say, yeah, yeah, nod their heads. Yep, or not, it takes the individuals in the community who are the true stewards in a commonwealth of their waters. In the commonwealth, it is the municipalities that control their waterways. It is not the state, really. The state can come in and tell you under the Clean Water Act, which is federal, you need to do certain things. But they're telling you, you need to do them. They're not saying, we'll do it for you. They're saying, you need to do it. By being proactive and doing it yourself, you get it done faster, cheaper, better, more to your liking. I guarantee it. Because remember that we have done these analyses on 70 estuaries in the region already. So we have quite a track record of understanding both how to assess them, but also how to restore them. And uh, with all respect, we stole bets for our technical team. Because she really is part of our team for this project. Uh, the primary <coughs> threat to Cockies as well as all Westport estuaries is really, again, the same as it is for Buzzards Bay and all of southeastern Massachusetts, is nutrient increased nutrient loading. It's really nitrogen loading to the estuary, and that comes from changes in land use. Uh, the, the change in land use in this region is a little bit originally a change from pine oak forest to, to agriculture, and more recently from agriculture to residential. Uh, and as we're sitting here, a beautiful golf course looking out on Cockies Pond. This certainly is not a pine oak forest, and there is some nitrogen loading associated with anything you do, even if it's putting in a parking lot. So, so right now, we've been increasing this, and we're seeing the effects of that in different parts of the region. And Westport River, both East and West Branch, is impaired. It does have, uh, it have to be restored eventually under the Clean Water Act. The Federal Clean Water Act dictates that we restore copies to be the same way as a brackish marine system. But what happens with, with nutrients, and this is just the primer, is that what happens is you start seeing, <coughs> as we increase loading of these systems, and they have gone up, even with the changes in, <coughs> in, in land use, sometimes they increase, sometimes they decrease, but we are still over the limit, and we're seeing phytoplankton blooms, we're seeing no, there is no eelgrass in copies. It's not clear that there ever was, but there hasn't been in recent decades. So we don't have any trace back for several decades that there was eelgrass there. But we also <coughs> lose benthic animal populations, which is the, the reason we talk about why well, we want to have uh, different types of, of uh, anadromous fish in here. They have to eat something. Sometimes what they're eating is the benthic animals. The avian population, the wading birds, they, they eat both fish and the benthic populations. But what happens is when nutrients of benthic populations go away, and in over two-thirds of the estuaries in southeastern Massachusetts are significantly impaired, 
uh, habitat for benthic animals. In some systems, there are no benthic animals left. You don't see it because you're up here and they're down there, but they're gone and they're gone specifically because of nutrient loading, and that is true for parts even of the Westport River, East Branch. Um, you start seeing low oxygen and fish kills. We're not seeing that in Cockies right now. Uh, I don't think we're going to see it because I think that Cockies is going to be returning to better conditions, not to worse conditions. But you do have macroalgal accumulations. That's one of the highest end problems in these systems. And Cockies has significant macroalgal problems, as you see. And at the highest levels, it's lost aesthetics, it's bad smells, but it is the macroalgae floating on the surface it is a high end terminal kind of, of issue. So it, Cock East, by way of this general statement, is primed for needing a fix. The only way you can fix, it, fix a system, either the Westport River or Cock East Pond, is to control nitrogen. There's a variety of ways you can control nitrogen. One of them is you control the input into the bay, into the pond, salt pond. The other thing you can do is you can increase the tidal exchange for the system to bring clean water in quicker, wash the, the high level nutrient water, laden water out quicker, and that will lower the levels because the system responds to the concentration of nitrogen in the bed. Although loading is what makes the system have high nitrogen, it is the rate at which it's flushed that controls the concentration, and it's that concentration which controls the health of the system. The other thing that we've been working on now, and we, we started a decade ago working on soft solutions for management. Uh, everybody knows about sewer, sewers and centralized treatment and collecting pump and tree, all that kind of stuff. But the reality is, it, is that that's only a, a fraction of the solution. A lot of the solutions now <coughs> are, <coughs> are based on adaptive management and soft solutions. Things like, like repairing freshwater rivers, repairing freshwater ponds that will just naturally attenuate nitrogen in pond, in estuary solutions that take out nitrogen from the water column itself and remove it. There's no sewers involved in any of this, and the infrastructure is much cheaper, but they, have, they only work in very specific areas. And as you'll see at the end, maybe copies just one of those areas. As I said, you know, we have a regulatory framework. We've already gone through this. We certainly, we work under the Clean Water Act, which is federal, uh, the state, has already put out the uh, TDL for Westport River under the Master Sedgwick project. For the whole river, what we see is the, these are <coughs> this is an average concentration where these milligrams per liter just suffice it to say the numbers don't mean anything. But what does mean something is anything above uh, 0.7 is really, really bad. So therefore, anything green or above, green, yellow, orange, red, is really bad. And you notice the green penetrates all the way down in the east branch to here and the west branch down here. These are tidally average, which means that the tide comes in, the concentrations drop, and the tides go out, the concentrations drive. But we're able, with our modeling, to take measured data by WRWA over many years and average it out tidally to come up with these. So these are the major zones of impairment here. What's not shown in this is that Cockies Pond would be also heavily impaired, even though it's getting good water from Westport. Westport Harbor. These are the thresholds of linear TMDL. And I only put them up because these levels are relatively low. They're less than half a milligram per liter. I will tell you that, that Cockies hasn't seen half a milligram per liter for decades. It's, it's much higher than that. And that's why we, that's why everybody's here today worried about it. <laughs> that's the reason. What people perceive is generally true. If they think a system's going south, it usually is. Maybe not the reason that they think, maybe not as much as they think, but people have a very good, your senses are very good at telling you the system's changing and you don't like the way it's going. Well, the way to deal with a system is first, we will monitor uh, the, the system, a monitor in this case, copies or all of Westport, and that's your water quality monitor program that's been running for more than a decade, uh, much more than a decade, probably almost two decades, or even longer. And, and that just assesses the general condition. It doesn't tell you anything about how to fix it, but it does tell you if something's wrong. Sort of like getting your temperature taken when you go to the doctor. You walk in, they stick their monitor in your mouth, and, and if you have a fever, uh, then you're in trouble. If you don't have a fever, it doesn't mean you're great. It just means you don't have a fever. That's how work while I'm monitoring. 
we did this quantitative watershed abatement ass assessment and modeling for all of the Westport. Now we're doing a very refined uh, model just for Cockey's Pond. Because in order to, if, if you're going to spend a nickel on restoring it, you really should spend that little extra, which you are, to do that refinement. So you get the plan for that pond. And as I said, that pond is relatively independent of, of Westport Harbor, which is its feed water. And so therefore, you can restore it separately. If it was so intimately connected to Westport Harbor, then we have great water quality because Westport Harbor has the high, cleanest water quality in Westport uh, River System and also pretty much in southeastern Massachusetts. So with that in mind, you know that this is isolated from it because it doesn't have the oil it doesn't have the spentacumus, it doesn't have scallop, it doesn't have any of that good stuff. It's all pretty clear in common sense. What we're doing is we're doing a feasibility analysis. And we don't just do things, we don't do studies for studies. The MEP was not a study for studies. When we set that up in 2002, believe it or not, uh, we set it up with the condition that, yeah, yeah, we like to do research and we publish our papers, but that's not the mission. The mission is to see how many, how many square kilometers of estuarine surface or estuarine waters in southeastern Massachusetts we can return to clean enough conditions that people would be happy to think back to this is the way it should be. So this is a design for restoration. That's, that's what we're trying to do. It's feasibility. After that, we have to go into implementation. We will come up in this analysis with a series of, of action items that you could take, some that may take a long time, but some that you could do immediately. Okay, like that. Things you can do right away. And, and uh, hopefully, well, we don't know really the balance of them yet, and we don't even know which ones uh, because we haven't complete the study. But the mission it is for this system when we took it on, it's a really neat system. It's got one channel, it's shallow, going in and out. It's a nice salt pond, relatively well mixed horizontally. You know, there's not some big gradients across the pond. You know, it's not like really high over there, really low over there like the Westport Rivers. It's because the inlet's in the middle. And the water residence time is very long. So we're thinking that, you know, this is a good, good system for, for uh, adaptive management where you can do something and you really can get a measurement of how much it was restored and then do something else and do it again so you're not just spending money to fill out the plan. And then that's the adaptive management part is continuing the monitoring that's going. Monitoring is sort of required now under the TMDL and under the state for these things because they finally realized after, let's see, we started in 87. So let's say since 88 until now, it's finally come out that, yeah, you know, this, this information is really informative for making decisions. It's really cheap to get, and it really does tell you something about what's going on. All right. This is a work by mine program that the, <coughs> that uh, WRFA has run forever <coughs> in concert with a variety of people, Coalition Coast Bay, SMAS, all these stations out in the, out in the, uh, uh, Estuary, the long gradients. There's so many stations because there's big gradients, as you saw, where very high concentrations here with the freshwater river coming down, carrying a lot of nutrients, and then a slow improvement as you come down towards Westport Harbor and the inlet. Same thing with, with West Branch. Down here in Cock East, there's just a couple of stations, but those have been, been measured now since 2008. Time flies when you're having fun. So, so it, it's sort of the data was collected and gathered and look at it and analyze every year and da dum da dum da dum. But now we can pull it out, we can look at it, and we can start coming up with, with temporal trends. And I'll show you that in a second. Because the temporal trend analysis is part of now what we're doing new now in copies. As I said, this is a part one update. So, you know, it's sort of like a progress report, so don't expect me to come up with a conclusion because then next year when I give you the full report, and I don't have anything to say, and I don't get to come out with the copy you spawn in this case. Um, so anyway, jokes aside, uh, this, the phase one project is broken into five components. We go back and we did more water quality monitoring, more detail this, this past summer. But we also went back to 2008, we analyzed all the data again uh, to look for trends. And which is a good thing. It's not getting worse, it's staying the same, it's getting better. What? We also are spending a lot of effort quantifying the water exchange between the harbor and the pond. And the reason for that is the source of clean water for Cockies Pond is coming from the harbor. 
So the more water that comes in from the harbor, then the lower the nutrient levels here and the better this will be. And <clears throat> of course, if you close it off, then all the groundwater and sort of minimal surface water inputs uh, that are flowing into the pond would then build up those nutrients because the, the nutrients enter the pond mainly through fresh water. Rain, groundwater, a little bit of surface water that goes in. That's where the high concentrations of nitrogen come from. And the nitrogen coming from the watershed, which is these fresh water inflows, is, is, the, is sort of the worst kind of nitrogen for an estuary because it's inorganic. It's the same stuff that makes your lawn grow. It doesn't matter the source. The source of that nitrogen could be fertilizers, could be uh, septic tanks, could be agriculture, could be storm water, could be road runoff. It still ends up, by the time it reaches the bay, you're looking at inorganic nitrogen, mainly nitrate, because, and it's all the same. It doesn't matter where it came from. The effect on the estuary is the same. Okay. So uh, we're looking at that. The measuring the water levels is important because this pond, uh, once we started looking at it, we need to know is it, is it, how does it function relative to tides and, and ups and downs. And we'll see why in a second. That's where we really into the project. The third tree, we have to do a detailed bathymetric plan. Now, there's the depth contours. You know, for, the, for those of you that, that probably all of you who go out in boats know that you're looking at charts and you're looking at the depth of the water. Well, we do that. We use the same equipment that's used to do those high quality maps that people use for boating. We do it in Cockies because we want a detailed concept of the volume of the pond. Because we need to know the turnover of water in the pond. Remember, get back to this whole thing that the water, the nutrients go in, the water myths up, and water going in and out controls the nutrient levels. Well, that's the turnover of water. So we have to know how big the bucket is. So we do the bathymetry, get how much the bucket. And then we do the, the water level changes, tells us how much water is going in and out. And then we can get the how much water is turning over in the pond every day, all year long. And that tells us a lot about how to manage this system. Now, I should tell you, just going to cut you off now. Anybody who's going to raise their hand and say, why don't we just make it a saltwater pond? That's a problem. Because there's a large investment in people trying to maintain freshwater and anadromous fish fronts in this pond herring, white perch, things like that. DMF is very interested in this pond. So to come in and say, well, we're going to turn it to 25 parts per thousand. Well, then there are no herring. You can't spawn. White perch can't spawn. Eels won't go in there and spawn. So we're sort of caught in a, in a kind of little weird world that we have to deal with. Uh, and we never just go one way or the other. We always have to do the analysis. Should this be managed as a freshwater pond? Should it be managed as a brackish water pond, which is sort of half marine, kind of low salinity? Should be managed as a marine system? 20, 25 parts per thousand, Westport Harbor being 32 or 31. So, so that's what we're looking at. But this system, because of all the other competing uh, interests for the resource, resource quality and resource utilization of this pond, we're sort of being pushed a little bit to a little fresher than, or keeping it the way, exactly the way it is, would be a little fresher too uh, than, than we would in, in some other systems. We also have to look at the animals. As I said, the animal communities that live in the pond and in the bottom of the pond are critical to its role as a, as a uh, nursery ground for uh, fish, birds, whatever, for the outer estuary, and then also Buzzard Bay. So, because that is really how the food chain starts for a lot of these species. And <clears throat> it really comes down to, if you just like to bird watch, you, need to, you want to know what's happening in the info. If you want to uh, fish, 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 then you want to know. And if you want to project forward to what kind of environment it might be for shellfish, you want to, shellfish are in the for the most part, like coho, and hard shellfish, coho. Uh, so, so we're doing characterization of that as well. And that will tell us, because there is no eelgrass, we do eelgrass, if there is eelgrass, we do eelgrass. We're doing macroalgae that just didn't get on this list because it's not in the scope. But in doing this analysis for this talk, we figured we better get out next year and do a, a detailed survey of those drift algae that float to the surface you see in the summer. What you see on the surface is a tiny fraction of what's in the pond. The only stuff on the surface is what was on the bottom that got enough decay or enough, enough oxygen produced during photosynthesis to float to the surface. If you dive down, you're going to find the bottom. Usually, uh, if you haven't done the survey, we're going to do it next time, is going to be a big, thick mat smothering the bottom. Because that's the way it is in the other estuaries in southeast, and salt ponds in southeast. But we don't know for sure, yet, but that is my supposition. So here's Cap East. <coughs> Good 
the channel is right here. It's a very narrow, small channel <coughs> coming in from Westport Harbor. <coughs> These are the water quality stations. There's another. There's other stations out in uh, the West Branch, of course, so but they're not shown on this map. But just suffice it to say that the entire larger estuary has monitoring in it. And has had it for five more years than, or even more, ten more years than the Cockies. The good news is that's enough time, 2008 to 2015, or what will end up being eventually 2016, is enough to really make some statements. Uh, so we take measurements out here a couple times a summer. Um, if in deeper areas, there'll be two depths, in shallow areas, it's, it's mid depth. Depends on if the water column's mixed. If it's mixed, then you don't have to do profiles. If it stratifies, then you do. Okay. A little bit kludgy talk because I only have what we did, uh, you know, what we're supposed to do and what we did, less so the grand synthesis at the end because I only have all the data we have to do the grand synthesizer and we collect it. It's next year. But what we did too is we put <coughs> tide gauges in out here. We put one uh, gauge out further in the pond to measure pond level over long periods of time. It measures pond level every 10 minutes and we get an, an estimate of. of you know, the, the water volume exchange. So it goes up, water staying in the pond, and down, it's leaving. Pump. We have other ones out in the in the harbor, one boathouse, uh, to measure the driving tide out in in uh, the Westport Harbor. And we also periodically have one uh, up in here, up in this region, up in here, but it's not permanent. These are permanent gauges uh, that are recording all the time. We also, in addition to this, look at the water flow directly, measuring it rather than calculating. We calculate the water flow by just how big the pond is, and if the water goes up and goes down, then we know how much water should have gone in and out, and we can calculate the flow through, but we also will directly measure that because you never know. And when we directly measure the flow in and out, we can also measure the nutrients in and out. And that's really important to know about the pond function. I'll show you that in a second. We have three system, three tile runs that we've already done. We usually only do about three. Uh, for these systems, if the data comes out right, these data come out right. I'm going to show you a little bit from uh, from mid July uh, that we just did this past summer. Uh, we look at different phases of the lunar tidal cycle. This will be a spring. So that'll work. This is uh, June 4th to June 12th. This is the record in <coughs> Westport Harbor of this tide height. Nice and regular, nice big tide. These are meters, so this is going up about you know uh, a meter and a quarter or so. You know, and meters, you know, f uh, forty inches about. So you know, you're, you're talking about four or five feet foot tide. Nice tide. This, this here is in that creek. As I said, we had a tide gauge there periodically. This is a tide in that creek, but it's not on this scale. It's on this scale, so you can see it. If it's on this scale, it would just be a flat blue line. So this is the tide in that creek. And what you see is, is that the inlet channel is so heavily restricted, you just don't put tide in. I mean, this is, is a meter and a quarter, so 120 centimeters or so. This is about five to seven centimeters. OK, that's what it is. And that's just a, it's still in the channel, not in the pond. This green line, again, on this scale, and they're, off, they're offset so you can see them. We, we will bring them all together on common data, but you don't need that today. So what you see in this green line is actually the, the stage elevation in the pond. And what you see is the stage elevation bears no resemblance at all to the tide in the harbor or even the tide in the creek. The pond is acting like a system it's acting like it is. It's a pond with a channel to another body of water. It doesn't matter what that other body of water is. It could be Lake Michigan. It's another body of water. And so what we're seeing is, is that wind whole blows water into the pond, or it rains. The water level in the pond builds up. And then the wind stops, and it stops raining, and the water level goes down. Because look at these, these cycles here. This is from, from here to here is uh, 12 hours. From here, you don't even see anything in that period. And you only see like one high, one high, one high over the time here where there might be 15 highs. 
in the peaks. And so this is not tidal. It's not a tidal influence. There's a little tide that gets in there. That's where you get the salt water. But this is water being blown in from the wind from, from Westport Harbor, pushing up and going into the pond and dumping some salinity. That's why the pond has salt water. This didn't happen. We didn't have water in the pond. We raised that channel, that culvert, just a little bit to prevent that, that storm flows from going. It's not really a storm flow, but wind-driven surge going in. We wouldn't have any salt in the pond. We looked at that. This is the period. This is when we're, I'm going to show you the, the tide exchange from. That's why the bars, that's when we did an experiment. This is the long-term record, the blue, of the tides in the harbor. And this is the long-term record. It's not very long. It's like a month. It is a month, actually. A month of July. This is the, and this is the water levels in the pond. And you can see a few little bumps here and there. But for the most part, you're not seeing any correlation between these. And in fact, we do a lot of, of different types of of trend analysis. And what you see is, is that the, the storm cycle in this region is about six days. Every six days, we get a new front end. That's pretty much what it is. On average, four to six days. It can be a little longer, it can be a little less. And so the frequency of these, of course, this is a real tide. So you see a peak every 12 hours and, and uh, 12 and a half hours. And so, so this is being run by meteorology, and this is being run by the moon and the and the sun, it's tides. So, so this is important for us to understand as we go about this. Doesn't mean we have to change it because the pond has salt in it and it seems to be pretty stable. That's a good thing. So, but what he says is we have to be very, very careful if anybody wants to go in and start changing that inlet to do something. We would have to put control structures in, or else we could change the, the salinity. And please understand. If you take a pond that's 10, and this is 10, you jack it up to 30, salt a, is a toxin, right? We salt fish, so we preserve it. If you take fish that are, that are, are acclimated and have grown up and developed uh, over millennia to certain salinity, and you jack up the salinity way high, you will reduce their, you'll increase their stress, reduce their spawning, and then will eventually be replaced by other species. That can be good, that can be bad, depending on how you want to manage the pond, but it will happen and you have to know that. Uh, this, just, uh, this is just a wind, wind trace that matches that other trace that, that I'm not going to get into because it's just too much minutia. But the guy who did it made me promise to show it. <laughs> so, uh, this is then standing on in mid-July of this year, standing in that channel at the little wooden bridge and doing a, a, a flow measure. This is the tide heights in the harbor. This is actual flow in, into, from here, into and out, uh, in and out of the pond because there is flow in and out. And it does match, to some extent, the harbor high tide, low tide, to some extent. And it's because when the water is low, it, it, it doesn't back up in the channel. It actually allows the water to flow out but, what's, but that is not coming in on a nice flood and ebb cycle. It's very irregular. But, and this is in the channel, so it's lower. That's where we did get a time. So I sort of cheated by showing it. But I show, I show this whole thing for this reason. <coughs> on, the, on the ebb tide, you just get these flat, this is uh, chlorophyll leaving. So it's phytoplankton. It's biomass. It's blue. It's, it's uh, salinity. And the whole point is the salinity of the pond is about 10 parts per thousand. This is the pond. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. The pond does not vary very much at all. When the tide reverses and comes in, then that's when you get these pulses of salinity. It goes all the way up to almost 30 parts per thousand. It's not a lot of water, but it's coming in very high. And that's the harbor water. What you see, of course, is the chlorophyll drops to about half. And that's typically what will happen. It will drop. It will be high, and it will drop. With total nitrogen, that's the exact opposite. So it's the same, type of return. High nitrogen in the pond. That's on this scale. These are very high numbers. Around a milligram. And then, then when the tide comes in from the harbor, then very low nitrogen coming in with that water. That's why the idea is when we increase flushing, we can lower the nitrogen levels, because the water coming in, if we increase flushing, 
will be about a third of the concentration of the water leaving. So it is really clean out there compared to here. Well, that's just sort of pond function. Our, our job, I mean, for us it might be the exciting part of the job, but our job is to understand how Cockney's pond works. Whether it's not the broken part, it's not the assessment part. How does this work? How do the, does the wind and the tides control the water quality in this pond? How does the watershed, which we're also working on, control the nutrient levels in the pond? And how changing the channel would control the you know, change that balance. The other part that we do, though, is this assessment of the habitat health, which is what is the quality of the habitat in the pond right now. And from that, we do look at these long-term records. We look at dissolved oxygen this summer. We, we're, we're supposed to do that next summer. We did a little bit last summer. And as you'll see, it wasn't that bad. Uh, same thing with oxygen chlorophyll, go hand and glove. We do do the benthic animal assessment. And the benthic animals, you get a lot of things. You look to see what's there. And you can determine if the system is highly productive or not so productive or it's dead. You can determine that. But the other thing is those animals that live there have adapted to certain conditions. You can tell by the species that are there, by their natural history, about the quality of that environment. If, for instance, there are certain organisms that we encounter in certain buzzards, bay estuaries, that we really find only in things like uh, sludge, offshore sludge dumping sites where they go and they dump sewage sludge after it's digested and that's what grows up on them. It's very small, very small worms and they grow fast, reproduce really fast and die. But they don't really, it's not a stable environment, it's not a stable community. Other areas like in lower Westport, we see in the harbor, Jason Harbor, we see very rich communities that have large species that means economically important species as well, and, and that are very stable. So you see the same community there year after year after year. In the upper westward estuary, not so much. And then really the big, the big telltale sign is this macroalgal distribution abundance. Because, because what happens with macroalgae is when they grow in a system, they will smother the bottom. They absorb at night the oxygen. The sediment goes anoxic and gets sulfitic and it kills things. And so we don't see a lot of production in those types of environments. So it's a, they also will destroy or, or damage salt marshes. This is though, this was very interesting. This is the, the total nitrogen concentration in summers in Cockney specifically. In 2008 to 2014, which was the last year that we had a complete workup of all the data. These are just the different fractions of nitrogen, the different colors. But, but there was a, a downward trend. It's highly variable at this point, and we don't know. But what we really do start to think is they're putting the culvert in sometime around in here. And we're not, it's uncertain whether, whether this more stable lower stuff has to do with the fact that there is a better flow out of the pond, which means a better exchange in the pond. Uh, now than there was by all intents and purposes before that culvert was put in. Culvert didn't change the pond in any huge way, but, but it's a very sensitive system, so that may have been enough to drain some of the nitrogen out and get things going, going a little bit better. The problem with this is, is it's highly variable, and what we need to do is clean this up and really, really get in and find out it's really improving. The good news is, most of the time, the line's going the other way. Okay. And people say, oh, good, we don't have to do anything. Whee! This is the threshold. When we did the state water quality standards for, for nitrogen, uh, we wrote draft standards for the Commonwealth a number of years ago. We used 0.7 milligrams per liter as the everything's dead line. But that, that's the cutoff for severely impaired. So just because the numbers are coming down, I mean, it's sort of like, well, you know, there's no oxygen in the room and everybody's passing out. Well, we'll increase it to 1% and you'll all feel better. No. So, so it's, it's just still really bad, but, but it means that if this is true, that we have less distance to go for full restoration. Read that as it's easier to get full restoration. That's a good thing. It's cheaper to get full restoration. And that then has changed our mind about what you might be able to do in this system. Remember, we have to get fully acquainted with, with 89 asteroids. It's really hard to pick up every little salt pond in every one of those as you do it. 
in the detail you need. And I will tell you that just doing this the first year has really opened our eyes as to the possibilities of what you could do here cheaply and quickly to get a really nice system if you want. I don't mean if you wanted to get it better, I meant if you wanted to do those things. Uh, so this is just some, we had a brief period of auction a meter out there last summer. It's about a week around our, our this is our uh, sampling dates. It just shows, this is auction, and it shows that the auction levels are pretty good. They don't go below six. This is the diurnal signal. The lights go on at 7 a.m. or so. It starts going up around uh, <coughs> 4 in the afternoon. The auction levels start to drop. This is, and, and the drop has to do with really the respiration of the bacteria, fish, but really the, the algae themselves. They start to consume oxygen more than they produce, and the oxygen levels drop in these eutrophic systems. This is eutrophic system. Eutrophic just means it's enriched with nutrients and organic matter. That's the group of these. And this is the phytoplankton. And what's going on is also the macroalgae are there. And it's a very shallow system. So the macroalgae have a much bigger impact on water column process than they do in a lot of other systems like in the main estuary, for instance. This is, uh, this is macroalgae. This stuff out here, this sort of fuzzy surface of the water that you see, this is last summer, is actually those floating mats that come up to the surface. All of this coverage, the beach ends here, that's water. This is water, but it's covered with macroalgae mats. And then the same thing here, this is near shore, but out in the water, you see all these clumps of floating algae. And that's, that, I think, is one of our prime things that we have to try to deal with. Good news about it is, is that unless it, it doesn't float to the surface, it is consuming some of the nutrients, allowing some light to get in. But really, it's a bad thing because what it does to the bottom communities. But again, we're still assessing the real impact. We don't know the distribution of this in the water. <coughs> it's cover the whole pond, just one of the basins. So we have to get at that because this is something that needs to be fixed. And, and just to let you know, in the summer, this is what can happen. It's not that there aren't animals in the pond. This is a different pond. This is a pond in Falmouth. And these are just rough numbers. But these are just numbers of animals in the bottom. By, by, it was just a side project just to look at this very thing. You see there's lots of animals, 15,000 per meter square, things like that. Nothing out of them. But then you get into summer, and they drop. There is a sample there. It's actual zero. This is as close to zero as you can get. And what really happens with this says is, is that a lot of our systems that are stressed on have very high numbers of benthic animals in the wintertime, but they're little. You know, they're growing. They're babies. And then, but in the summertime when they should be really growing, they die because of either they're smothered by macroalgae or there's no oxygen. And so there's nothing there. And so the trick of management is to get these guys that make up that bar to live through the summer to over here. That's, that would be restoration. So we, our job is to change the environment in such a way, really reset the clock to the way it was decades ago, but change it back to that so they can make it through the winter to be a highly productive, stable community. Not through the summer. So we're doing that this year. These are the sites where we've done that with all these blue pins. It's where we're collecting benthic animals for assessment of the community structure, health, diversity, productivity, biomass, things like that. But I don't have that worked up. That takes some time. So, you know, our status conscious, I mean status, I mean state status of the project approach. <coughs> We're pretty much done with our water quality assessment. We're going to continue it, but with, with the year one, we're pretty well done. Year two for the water levels, we have that pretty well nailed. We'll continue it. We're continuing it, but we got it not. Uh, we know how to do it. We know what we're going to get. We have a year's worth of data. Same thing with the quantifying the nutrient and, and water exchange between the pond and the harbor. Same thing with getting the bathymetry and volume of the pond so we can turn over times. We don't have all the data compiled to get the turnover times yet. We have yet to assess the health and benthic communities because we're still collecting the data. We will do that through the middle of November and then analyze that data. And then we're always doing data gap analysis, which means what did we leave out? What, what is it we forgot to do that we don't want to get caught at the end of the project saying, you know, we really could have done this if we had measured this too. Well, that thing is getting this macroalgae <coughs> survey done. <laughs> That's, that was part of our gap analysis. We're not <coughs> expecting, if you really want to know, the macroalgae that we 
So the next part, we have, we're going to be putting in these moorings, which also give us uh, tide, by the way. So we're putting uh, two in, one in the upper and lower basin. We'll be continuing our water quality monitoring. We're going to put back the second station. We're done in one station now. We're going to put the second one back. We're going to do some measurements of recycling of nitrogen in the pond because just to know how much goes in and how much goes out doesn't tell you. It could cycle five times. So you can have one unit of nitrogen go, go in, create five units of, of uh, organic matter because it's being decayed and recycled, decayed, recycled, decayed, recycled, and then leave. And, and that means that that one unit is really powerful to affecting the pond. Other ponds in this region, other estuaries in the region, one unit goes in and recycles twice. So you, ha you have to know how many times does it recycle because that magnifies the impact. So we measure that. You, you can't guess it. There's no book you can go to that will tell you. There's no engineering text that you can pull a number. <coughs> we have watershed loads for this pond that were developed under the MEP, and we have to pull that in to this whole, to this whole loading thing, and we have to develop a model. If this system's easy enough, we can just do a simple box model for it, which we've done also for Allen's Pond, and for, to test well, what would happen if you change the load, what would happen if you change the flow, and then management options is, what, is really the con big conclusion. So what we have, what we know now is Cuffey's Pond, it says it's highly nitrogen rich. I could just say still highly nitrogen rich. It has reoccurring macroalgomats and drift elements. That's a real problem. Uh, the regulators would, would, would know that as well. The pond exports nitrogen and organic out of Westport Harbor. That's because the concentration of the pond is so high, we measure these very large loads leaving the system to go out and, and add nutrients in and get it out of Westport Harbor. That's not a good thing. So there, therefore, if you want to feel really good about yourself, fixing Cockney's Pond also helps to restore it in some way, Westport, all over Westport River. The other thing is the new 2008 culvert from that, one, that uh, 2008 to 2014 analysis may have actually improved conditions, but not enough to, to restore the pond. It's still significantly impaired. The water exchange within Pond Harbor is very limited, as you can see, and, and with wind and, and really storms, meteorology playing a big role, which is not typical, by the way. I should just tell you, with salt ponds, usually it's not that way. Usually they're very significantly tidal. <coughs> but you do have multiple management options uh, that, are, that we're looking at, which I'll, I can talk about sort of towards the end, which this is the end almost. What are those options? Well, we don't know. We're going to look to see what your options are relative to, to altering tidal flushing and circulation. But as I said, with the, with the, as most coastal waters in Massachusetts, or, and actually in the U.S., there are competing uh, needs or, or desires for that resource. And so if the desire is to restore herring, spawning area and growth area, because herring are having a tough time right now, then that means that you have to maintain salinity of parts of the pond at certain levels. That's what it means. If the thing is, no, no, you can't do that. We'll never get the pond good enough to have herring because even though it can get fresh enough, it's so eutrophic it's not going to work, well then we look at other things. And that's the analysis we have. You can also look at, at nitrogen source reduction. I said I'm not going to look at, at centralized, decentralized here. It's, that's Cockney's pond. Let's get serious. The other thing is fertilizer education. This just doesn't mean the golf course. It means everybody in the watershed to lower the load because the pond has gotten better. But the other thing is, is that we have now, over the last five, six years, have been working very hard at in estuary solutions, floating wetlands, um, uh, things like uh, reactive permeable barriers that intercept the nutrients as it gets to the bay. is not going to work for you because there's not any big source. If you have a plume, that works. If you have just a distributed, you guys have just this beautiful spread out everything here. That means that you can't go and put a pipe in and suck it all out. So, so that's not going to work. But we've been working a lot with uh, the town of Falmouth, the town of Orleans, the town of Barnstable, the town of Mashpee, to work uh, on, on putting, using shellfish as a way to lower nitrogen in the estuary. And we're the only group really in New England that has actually been able to quantify 
you have to quantify. We can do it. We know what happens. But to quantify how much nitrogen they remove, and what happens is, is that they actually move a lot. And it's just as supposing we saw this group where people from outside of Massachusetts and New England, mainly in the Chesapeake, are also doing this and they're starting to use this. Mashpee has put this in their comprehensive wastewater management plan or nutrient watershed management plan. The state has accepted it as an acceptable alternative. Does that mean it's going to work here? I don't know. It's only 10 months into a two-year project. But what I'm going to tell you as a teaser just is that if we're going to be looking this year at that with the idea, and it may not even be allowed by DNF, <coughs> but, but if it is, the salinity is right, the, the pond is right for that type of, of management that it, it's worth looking at. And we're not going to spend any money on it. We're just going to do the analysis as part of this project to see, because that's something that you can start doing. And we've had very good luck in, in increasing water clarity and removing nitrogen from the water column by, by doing this. And other towns now in the region are doing it at a larger scale. Let's let them do that for another year and see how it works out. If it, if it works for them, then we'll talk about if we can do it. Okay, that's good how to do it. And so we'll know. And since we're doing all our analysis, it's not for cost anything, but, but we will, uh, we'll know. We should know in a year. Because it's already been five years or six years. That, to me, would be potentially exciting. But you would have to want to do it. Because there's things that come along with this type of, of restoration that do uh, affect other resource uh, uses. Okay. All right. And I think that's it. Yes? One of my favorite shots. That's sunrise. That's it. I don't know if you took it. I like using sunrise because it's like the new beginning. Yes? Our home is at the north end of Cockish Pond. Mm -hmm. And uh, the stream must vary the quality because that stream at times is very full. Well, the yep. times, of course, it's not. But yep. it's after rainfall, we, we have quite a stream that goes yep. out of the north end. Yeah. And, and storm, when I talk about meteorological events, that would be rain. And that would be the stream then, right? And in uh, that stream, it gets water both from storm sea and from groundwater. You know, it's always flowing, yeah. whether it's raining or not, and then it goes up after the rainstorm. Right. So, so uh, that's something that we that is a source of nutrients. Uh, I don't know what we can do other than determine what it is, what the load is, because we can't do much in the stream. We can look at if there's any damage. Like if a repairing zone has been, if it's been channelized, we can then fix that. I mean, it's just a source, right? It's, it's actually a highway. It's not, yeah. um, to what degree does the tremendous amount of rain that swans and geese on that line contribute to the nitrogen? Well, you know, we've done, we've done a lot of that. And what we find is, is that the avian population, swans, geese, cormorants, sea ducks, things like that, um, provide a lot of bacterial contamination. So they can really jack up the coliform levels, uh, which, which then, it's so silly, that could hurt us down the road relative. We want to do bivalves for, for propagation because you don't want to create a quote unquote attractive nuisance in an area that has bacterial contamination, so you don't think they're allowed to do it. That's what we're going to look at. But, for nitrogen, not so much. It's just not. It's just not a big deal because of what they eat and how much they poop and uh, where they get the food that they eat. And yes, we know they're importing uh, stuff, but not 100% of, of what they experience. Uh, we've had a big deal with phosphorus. Uh, we're, we've been working on Cedar Pond in Orleans, which is in the press all the time on the pig, for 13 years now, and uh, that's a cormorant problem. And uh, that is a thing, because that pond was fresh. And then some well-meaning people said, saltier is better. And open. Everything died. And the problem is, is that the, we want to get it back. We want to put it back the way it was before people went in and just changed it 13 years ago. And, um, but you can't, it's not going to work unless you control the cormorants because they're putting so much phosphorus in the pond that it's a freshwater water system. It's just going to be hyper mm -hmm. So they can be a problem. And also, the Bragmite has covered in about 100 feet of the north end of the pond. It just yeah. keeps marching down the pond. 
Yeah, that's a separate management issue. Uh, you are now allowed in the state in the comments to remove freight lights. You didn't used to many, many years ago, but you can get permission to remove them. A lot of that is the pond is only 10 parts per thousand salinity, as opposed and the ocean, out, not the ocean, but the bay is 30, 32. So it's very fresh. It's two thirds of the water is fresh water in the pond. And that salinity is well within the tolerance limit for freight lights. So if you can raise the salinity, you can get rid of the but, but you have to raise it above 15, you know, 15 to 20 million. I don't see that necessarily. But are you allowed to remove frag mining now? Uh, with a permit. Pardon? With a permit. How do you remove it? Hmm? How does one remove it? Cut it? Well, there, there's a couple ways. You can cut it. <coughs> the, the preferred method, you know, I started this when it was, you couldn't remove it. Now they say, well, what can you do? And one of the things that we, we do that's still done is they would have it. I don't recommend you do this yourself. <laughs> you, they would cut it, and then you would go out there with a, uh, with a 240 Roundup, and you'd have to blot the top of each stem. And then it would happen with the, the, uh, the phloem would carry, the, that part of the cross section would carry the toxin down the bottom. So, and then, there's other things now, but it always involves some sort of physical process. That doesn't affect the water quality? No, not, not that would. You're not spraying. Like yeah. in South Jersey Project, we worked on the 25,000 acres. And they they right. had big trucks out, like with fire things, spraying pesticides. And after they got done doing that, they would light it on fire and burn the whole thing. <laughs> but really, the, the only thing that really is the easy thing to do is if you can ever change the environmental factors which control it ability to live in a certain habitat. And that's why most Franklin's restoration projects in this region are because a system has become closed and then it's freshened and then the frag has come in. So what they do is they go and they open it. The salinity goes up and then they, they kill it. But you have to get it up high enough because the species that's in this region now is uh, Franklin's australis, the old species communis. And australis is an invasive. It's, it's not native and it takes a higher salinity so it's harder to do. I know you. Brian, there are many residences around Cockies Town uh, that presumably all have uh, conventional septic systems mm -hmm. and um, it's my understanding that one can introduce a denitrifying unit into a conventional septic system, add it in, and either pump it into an existing drain field or create a new drain field. Yep. That's, uh, most of them are that way, actually. Pardon me? Most of them are that way. They intercept the effluent from the yes. septic tank before the drain field and treat it and then put it back into the drain field. Well, I have, uh, I have one of those systems uh, because I'm near the river. And I've seen it. Yes. <laughs> And it removes 80 to 90 percent of the nitrogen. Uh, I have it tested every six months and take the samples over for water quality testing. And so I guess my question is, would it be possible for the residents around the pond uh, to explore the possibility of introducing denitrification units into their existing septic fields and thereby <coughs> reducing the flows through the gallon water that's coming in. Well, the less nitrogen in the pond is the benefit to the pond. The, the question is, it, it really comes down since there's no mechanism, it's a choice issue. If people choose to do that, then I, you know, I would encourage them to do it. But if, if, but there's no mechanism to say you have to do that. Yeah, I know. And but I, if people live on the pond and are worried about the pond, and yeah. want to know whether they can do something. Uh, my yeah. experience is that for about ten thousand dollars, you can introduce such a system. And, uh, yeah. and all I would for say me, about that could have a very high payoff. All I would say about that is one of the things that we did years ago is we established the the uh, alternative septic system test centers for these denied systems. It's at it's at Mass. It's now Joint Base Cape Cod. It's the Mass Military Reservoir. And that still exists, it's, and it's funded by 
the technology developers and DEP, uh, but it's run as an independent, like, um, consumer reports type thing. And that's We set it up that way. That's the way it was. And, and all of the systems tested there, which is a ton of systems now, there's a fact sheet on each one, which gives you then an independent, and it is independent, view of the efficiency of those systems. I would never buy one based on what, I'm sorry to say this, but I just, I'm from New Jersey. I can't <laughs> believe the developer, the guy who's trying to sell me that this, you know, this car gets 120 miles per gallon. You know, I can't believe that. I need to see some other things. So that's why I subscribe to Consumer Reports, and that's why I send people to the Test Center's website to check on the efficiency. But, uh, is that fair? Pete Cross Commission has been evaluating those systems and putting out reports for 10 yeah. years. The Barnes, these are my colleagues. The Barnesville County Department of Health and, yeah. and whatever it is. I'm sorry, environment. See it's the reason I say that is yeah. it was a terrible, nasty project to do and to set up. And George Hoyfeller is now the head of that department. Yeah. He's the guy who did it. And remember, in the beginning days, you didn't just go out and push a button and get your sample. You had to go get your sample. Yeah. But that's why I did one in my own backyard. Yeah. And I, it's why I'm getting down to 10 parts per million. Uh, coming out of the treatment unit, it, but it's a good thing. It it's a good thing. The it, is, it is not. We do not recommend those for a whole town-wide application. Yeah, that's right. Because the uh -huh. board of health is in charge of making sure they work really, and the board of health, not in Westbrook but any place, is not capable of handling two thousand of these. You know, to monitor and, and take care of them. But so there's, if you get wastewater districts, you can do that. But a little, little thing like this, do it. Then you're usually allowed to do it because there's, it only has to perform as good as your septic system to be legal. Well, our Board of Health has approved the systems here, hmm? and approved mine, and so it can be done. Yep, it can be done. Yep. If everybody around the pond did that, how big would the impact be? We will tell you, that's a real number that we will tell you, because one of the items in our list, you know, because you're going to be 10 months into a 24 month project, that, that one of the things on our list is this, uh, we have a land use analysis, which means we know how many septic systems there are around Cockney's Pond. And so then we can take those out and see what the effect on the pond. And, and how far away does the, how, if you, how far away can you be from the pond and still have your You just have to be within the watershed okay. to the pond. But oh, Cockney's Pond really has a very small watershed compared to like the estuary, the main estuary. But it you know comes up through here. Yeah. Will you attempt to assess the effect of the load from the golf from the club? Yeah. What we've done with various golf clubs around is is <coughs> I don't remember the part of I just forgive me. I don't remember exactly what we did for this club, for this estuary, but we, but we approach each club, we ask them for their specific fertilization protocol. In other words, how much do you fertilize your greens, how much do you fertilize your fairways and your roughs, and so we don't just pull a number out. We ask them to give us that number, we, plus we have files now of dozens and dozens of golf courses, and we know what really the parameters are in this region, these soils, and, and then um, we can uh, suggest sometimes if there's sometimes there's a, a public push to to try to lower loads and you know that we, we encourage people to, to have these forums and discuss them and frequently the golf clubs if they're not attacked you know people aren't coming up the hill with pitchforks and torches saying you're the problem if it's more like <coughs> part of the problem everybody's part of the problem and, and is there anything we can do is there any you know, organic techniques or whatever. Frequently, they're very amenable to listing those things, and sometimes they'll do them. And my best example is the first project I did was Nantucket Harbor years and years ago in the 80s. And the Walwinnet House, which is at the end of the harbor, head, head of the harbor, huge resort kind of thing, this huge one, they, they came to us and said, well, would it help if we just stopped using fertilizer and we just watered and put it? And they did. And their lawn was, was fine. Because a lot of times around here, what you need is is water. But it's on a golf course. Fairways need something different than your lawn. But 
But this was a huge resort that, that voluntarily shifted over. And they planted cool over Oh, you're letting me off. I have a question. Oh. In, in a situation like this, have you ever worked with neighborhood associations to mm -hmm. put in a common system that would, say, hook up six people? Yeah. And then another group that would do six, so that you kind of, instead of doing individual, would do cluster systems. Cluster systems are much better. Systems. Um, I mean, for me, um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do one because I'm getting the entire, I live in a planned development area, and they're going to do the whole thing. They're just going to sewer the whole thing because it's close housing. Um, but cluster systems are really good because you get a, a more constant flow. And you have uh, waste water treatment plants are living things. You know, they run on bacteria. That's what they do. And so if you only feed them, you know, you got one house and you're trying to feed this digester, it's really hard. So you get six, 10, up to 20 houses hooked together into a common unit. Then you get more uniform flows, you get you typically better year-round flows, and it just operates better. So the efficiency stays high. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and plus, you get the advantage of having, having one unit with a lot of people. And like, you know, in uh, New Hampshire, you know, and, and those places that I've been a lot, um, you know, they have that for, for water. A lot of places, they'll have some of a little water company and they'll supply 10 houses. In this region, we started that. I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe or less, uh, in Mashpee, we got a permit, and all the state didn't know how to do it. And what they did was they they wrote a condo permit. They said we're going to treat this as a condominium type approach, where each person does that agreement, but it's not for a condo; it's for a treatment plant. And if you go in and you s into Mashpee and you see Roach Brothers up on the hill and stuff, that's actually all set together, and it's hooked up to the the, the life facility, which is for disabled people up the hill and impaired people. And all of those homes and everything put together in a single unit, even though they have multiple people that own the properties. And it, so it's easily done now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.